make this a house of prayer this morning. not rush things. God, we thank you for your presence. Lord, just speak. God, I pray that you would open our blind eyes and open up those ears that have, because of apathy or just time, drifting away. They've become blocked to hear your voice. Father, let us see you in a very real way today. Speak to our hearts. We're listening, Lord. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.
You know, Jesus said that the wind bloweth whithersoever it listeth, and you'll hear the sound thereof, but you know not from whence it comes or to where it goes. And the same thing is true with the Spirit of God. It's amazing to me to be in the presence of God's people when God steps into the room. Folks, we have begun a series on prayer. I hope with all my heart that you will take to heart the lessons in prayer from Sunday school and what we do here because we are anemic when it comes to our prayer lives. We are anemic when it comes to the power and the Spirit of God working in our churches working in our families, working in our nation. Hear me, brothers and sisters. We're in danger of losing a generation. Like no other time in our history, we're in danger of losing an entire generation. And we're going to stand accountable for it. We need to become people of prayer. We need to be people who know how to pray and how to gain victory through prayer. And so for the next number of weeks, we're going to be studying it. I guess it's about eight weeks in our Sunday school classes and the same here in our main worship service. We're going to be talking about, preaching on, singing about, praying and learning what it is to pray, and learning what it is to be a people of prayer. And I hope that you'll begin to practice prayer on a regular basis as we go through this. If you're not a part of a Sunday school class, I want to encourage you, get involved. It's not too late. Become a part of our Sunday school and learn what it is to become a prayer warrior, someone who really seeks the face of God and can see a change happen because you have petitioned the throne room of heaven for someone who is lost or for a nation that is losing its way. Folks, God wants people who will pray. And we're asking you to join us. We're asking you to join us in this battle. You'll never be as close to the front lines uh, facing the enemy as you are when you kneel in prayer. And I encourage you to be a part of this time when we study and learn and begin to practice prayer. Well, I want you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 15 through 23. And as you're turning there to introduce the message today, I'd like to show you a video. I believe we have a video. Is that right, Brother Richard? We do have a video clip, or we don't? We don't. I apologize. That's okay. No worries. That's, we'll pick it up next Sunday. No, no, no. We'll just pick it up next Sunday. That's okay. That's fine. We're going to, about halfway through this series on Sunday evening, we're going to take Sunday evening and we're going to show the movie The War Room, in which uh, it's about a family, a couple of families, and they learn what it is to pray and they learn what it is to seek God's face. And we want to encourage everyone to come and be a part of that. It'll be a Sunday evening service. It'll be a, a very special time. We're going to kind of build toward that, but it'll be about halfway through the series as we do that. So, take your Bibles out, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. Actually, in the Greek, verses 15 through 21 is one complete sentence. And then you have the last sentence of this. But I want us to focus on something. The book of Ephesians, we're going to be looking in Ephesians throughout this study on prayer. But the book of Ephesians is a book that teaches us what it is to be victorious. And we're going to talk about that as we introduce this series today. Look in verse 15. It says this. I'll be reading from the ESV. I think there's a copy of the ESV there in the pew right there in front of you if you don't have one. But it should be up on the screens. Listen to this. Verse 15 and following. For this reason reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayer. So Paul is opening this part of the book of Ephesians by saying, I pray for you guys a lot. I thank God for you and I pray for you. 
Now I want you to really focus on verses 17 and 18. That's kind of what we're going to be uh, looking at today. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom. We're praying for the spirit of wisdom as we understand what it is to pray and to be people of prayer. And of revelation in the knowledge of Him. One of the greatest things you'll ever come to realize is who God truly is and what God truly wants to do in you and through you. Having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which you are, He has called you, what are the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints. And what is the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe? According to the working of His great might, that He worked in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, and power, and dominion, and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one that is to come. And he put all things under his feet. Everything now is subject to Jesus, and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body. You and I are the body of Christ in this world. The fullness of him who fills all and in all. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would do your work today. Holy Spirit, we pray that you will come and teach, instruct, convict, encourage, reprove. Lord, we ask for your will to be done today. Use this time in your word that will encourage us to become men and women of prayer. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There is a hope to which He has called all mankind to. There is a hope that God has called all mankind, not just believers, but all of mankind has been called. That hope is victory over the world and the world system and over our flesh and Satan. God wants you to be victorious over the world system and the temptation that the world system throws at you. God wants you to be victorious over your own flesh and that carnal nature that fights against everything that is spiritual, everything that is godly, everything that is righteous. God wants us victorious. God wants us to be victorious over Satan. Victory comes when we surrender to God. His glory and His will, no matter how difficult it may be, victory comes when we surrender to God and when we surrender for His glory and for His will. Jesus set that example when He surrendered to death on the cross for all of us. We will not be victorious unless we follow His example. We are eight days from the time we celebrated the resurrection. Did you know that it was on this day that the first declaration of one of the disciples that Jesus was God was made? When Thomas comes into the room and he says to the disciples, he's been off, nobody knows where he's been, he's been off, he hadn't seen the guys for about a week, they've come back together now, and see, he says, I will not believe unless... I put my hand in his side unless I put my fingers in in, in the nail prints. I will not believe. And then Jesus appears. And then when Thomas sees him, Jesus says, come Thomas, put your finger, put your hand in my side, put your fingers in the holes here that see the nail prints in my hands. You can do this. I'll let you touch me. I'll let you feel those spots. And Thomas, the Bible says, declared, my Lord and my God. That was the first time that Jesus had been declared God. It was the first time that the revelation of who He truly was came to bear down on the disciples. That happened on this day. God wants us victorious. When we follow the the example of the Lord, when we are willing to give up our wills and our way for God's way, we have victory. We will not be victorious until we follow His example. The book of Ephesians is a battle plan for victory. We cannot win against Satan. We cannot win against his schemes, his wiles, or his strength apart from fully following God's plan for us. His plan is aligned with the work of redemption and the glory of God. 
Everything we do must align with the will of God, and that is the work of redemption and God's glory. Now, God's intention is that you be a victorious Christian, a believer who goes from faith to faith in victory, regardless of how anyone may perceive you or think of you, regardless of your current circumstances, and regardless of your past. God wants you to be victorious in your life moving forward. Do you want to be victorious? Do you want to finally come to the place that Paul was when he said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? Do you want that in your life so that no matter what circumstance you face, no matter what happens in your life, you can live the victorious Christian life? That's what we're going to be studying. That's what we're going to be learning about over these next weeks. Then you have to learn. If you're going to be victorious, you've got to learn what it is to battle in your prayer life. Many of us don't even have a prayer life. Many of us rarely pray. But you're going to have to learn to do that if you're going to have all that God has for you in your life. Our prayer will bring victory when we pray, when what we pray for aligns with the glory and the will of God. Listen to this. Now, I'm going to give you just a couple of bullet points really quickly. We are called to be, we're called to battle victoriously for the church. God is calling us, and we're going to see that in the book of Ephesians. God is calling us to battle victorious for His church. It is what Jesus is the head of. We are His body. And he wants us to battle in prayer victoriously for the church. Did you know that Charles Spurgeon, one of the greatest preachers who ever lived, attributes the the fact that his church grew, attributes the salvations and the baptisms, attributes the size of his church uh, there in the middle 1800s, there in metropolitan uh, uh, London, right in the heart of the city, he attributes God's work in his life and the, the life of his church to the fact that over 300 people every single week were praying that God's Spirit would fill that church, would save souls, and would do God's work. We need people praying for the church and the work of God. We're called to battle victorious, uh, victoriously for our families. God wants you to ba- battle for your family. Our families are dissolving. Our fam- we're losing our family. We have, uh, y- you look at ABC, it's now no longer ABC or family, uh, whatever they used to call it. It's now freeform. Why is it freeform? If you watch any of the shows, they've got all these different definitions of family. God laid out a very clear picture of what the family looks like. It's a dad, it's a mom, it's kids. That's a family. That's when we're brought together. But now we've got all of these politically correct things that's going on in our nation. And so people are redefining the family. We need to pray for, we need to battle victorious for the true idea of what family is and for our families, our our mothers, our our dads our sons, our daughters. We need to battle victorious for our families. We are called to battle victoriously for God's ordained authority. We're living in a time when we see all of these different movements that want to set aside authority. They want to set aside those that have have, have done something in order to to accomplish something in our life, and they have people working for them, and then there's those people that work for them don't want to follow the rules and don't want to uh, engage. Christians are guilty of this. I knew a man that was a preacher, an evangelist. Man, he was a powerful preacher. But before he became that, he, he, he was working as a janitor, and he got fired. I mean, bec- and, and the reason he got fired is because he would lean on the mop more than he would actually push the mop, and he was talking to people. And he was being paid to do a job, yet he wasn't doing the job, and he claimed he was witnessing. Well, I want to tell you, you can witness, and you can still do your job. If you're being paid for something, do the job. Don't be looked at as being lazy. That is pitiful that a Christian, a fellow believer, would lose his job because he was, quote, witnessing. We can witness through the quality of the work we do and through the life we live. The problem is most of us, when we leave the job, we don't want to call the people we work with. We don't want to be with the people we work with. We want to be away from them, and we ought to be on the phone with them, inviting them to church. We ought to be on the phone with them, telling them about the Lord, praying for them, letting them know that they're loved and they're cared for. Folks, listen to me. Don't ever let it be said of you as a believer that you were doing spiritual things on the job instead of doing the job and allowing your work and the quality of your work and the testimony of your mouth and your life to speak Christ into the life of those you work with. Don't be guilty of that.
My goodness, please don't. We're called to battle victoriously for God's ordained authority. I, I laughed about it because this um, Occupy Wall Street group, there's a bunch of college age uh, kids that don't have jobs and don't have much to do and they get paid to do it. And it was really funny because there was a group of businessmen that began to kind of turn the tables on them and they followed them because a, the a, a new Apple store was opening up in a particular area and there was a group of them that had been out there occupying Wall Street, so to speak, blocking the entrance to their stores and not allowing the people to come into these stores to do business and they were creating some kind of havoc and it was costing these guys some money. So they started following these guys, these Occupy Wall Street guys around and what they did was that when these, these young people, they lined up there at the Apple store and they, they were waiting in line and they were waiting to go into the store to get their new Apple device and all, whatever iPhone was out or whatever it was that, that was the big thing that Apple had been pushing at that moment. And some of these guys came and cut in line. They just cut right in front of them. These guys start yelling, wait a minute, you can't do that. You can't. He's, you just, you blocked my store. You came out. Yes, I can. I'm occupying Apple. And so they kind of turn the tables on them. You see, it's really funny how that works, that they will occupy and they'll shut down a business or something. But when, they, when their rights are being infringed on them, they want to yell about it. We need to pray and pray victoriously for God-ordained authority, including our government. How many of you prayed for our president? Folks, I know that's a hard prayer, but we ought to be praying for our president and for our Congress that God would bless them with wisdom. We ought to be praying for whoever the next president is, who God's going to bring, that God will give that person wisdom and blessing. Folks, we ought to be praying for our authority. We're called to battle victoriously against the, uh, our wills and our desires. What I want, what I desire so, does not always line up with what God wants. We ought to pray against it. We are called to battle victoriously against the spiritual rulers of this world who hide in dark places. There is an enemy that is hiding that wants to destroy every one of us. We ought to be praying. So I'm going to give you four key points as we look at this passage today about spiritual wisdom, learning to, to look at things from a spiritually wise perspective about having our knowledge and our understanding increase. Number one, we need to create a successful plan. This is intentionality. You know what happens and why so many people don't pray and pray effectively? Is they're not intentional about it. They never really sat down and thought out, how do I really want to pray? What is it that I'm going to pray for? No victory comes arbitrarily or without thought and intention. If we will be successful prayer warriors, we must have a plan to do so. Know who and what you're praying for. You need to know who you're praying for, and you need to know what you're praying for. We are so anemic in our prayer life that we sort of allow it to kind of happen to us. We wait for the next big prayer push where people are sending out pray for this or pray for that. Or pray. Look, look, we ought to already have a prayer list where we're going down on a methodical, regular, consistent basis praying for this, praying for our own selves and our own walk with Christ, praying for those that are around us, praying for the salvation of some who are lost. Maybe we're praying for the, some that are close to us who are sick, but we ought to have a very specific prayer. Uh, prayer list that we're working off of. Know who and what you are praying for. Paul prayed for the believers and he prayed for their understanding and he prayed for their successful life in Christ. He said, I think of you often, I pray for you often, I give thanks for you often. He followed or he had a successful prayer plan. Jesus prayed for us. In John 17, the high priestly prayer of Jesus, Jesus prayed for every one of you. All that would come after the disciples. All that would follow him through the testimony of the disciples. Jesus prayed for us. He prayed for his Father's will and he prayed for his own self. So we ought to have some sort of a systematized prayer. Have a time and a pray, place for regular prayer. So we pray, we have, have a list, a prayer list. We know who and what we're praying for. But we also need to have a time and a place for regular prayer. Paul said that he made mention of them regularly in his prayers. He made it a point to pray, and he did so on a consistent basis. Folks, if we're going to be successful in prayer, we've got to make it a priority. We've got to be intentional about our, pr uh, our prayer. So we need to create a successful prayer plan. But secondly, we need to follow a successful prayer pattern. That's modeling. 
That's learning what it is to, we, we, we uh, struggle with this today. We want to reinvent the wheel. We want it to be something new. And uh, Folks, some things you don't need to reinvent. Some things you don't need to redo. You just need to begin practicing it. Paul prayed that as believers we would have our hearts enlightened. Spiritually, he wanted us to understand what was going on in the spiritual realm. Our hearts need to be enlightened so that we can see beyond just the, the initial physical or obvious need. There are going to be other needs that God wants to reveal to you in that. So we need to follow a successful prayer pattern. So we could know, and Paul prayed so that we would know the hope of God for us, so that we would know the full measure of the riches of his glory and his inheritance so that we would know and live in the power of Christ. There is a successful pattern right there that Paul was using and he used it across the churches. He used it in other churches. Paul would say to those who followed him, he said, follow me as I follow Christ. And he patterned his life and his prayer time after Jesus's. He lived according to the will of the Lord. He would use Jesus as his pattern for prayer and so should we. Jesus is a perfect example of how we should pray. We have a victorious leader who overcame and now rules and is the head of all. We must follow his lead if we're to be victorious as well. Jesus used prayer as a means of spiritual exercise and he practiced it often. He also used prayer as a means of spiritual warfare and he engaged in it often. See, he practiced prayer, spiritual exercise, and he engaged in spiritual battles through prayer, and he did that often. Jesus knew that prayer was not about his will, but about finding his Father's will. Here's where we mess up. We've decided that what I'm asking God for is more important than anything else. And if I don't get what I'm asking God for, well, then I'm just going to stop asking God for anything. Folks, God's wisdom is greater than your wisdom. God knows better than any of us. And sometimes the greatest answer to prayer that you and I will ever receive is no. Now, we don't like that. We live in a society where we look for the win win, win on this side, win on the. I'm sorry. Sometimes there is no win-win. Sometimes the best answer for anything that's going on, for any prayer request that's being asked is no. God's not going to do it because the wisest thing is not to give what's being asked for. We don't always know the full extent. We don't know the full measure. But God does, and we must trust God. So Jesus was about, not, not about his will, but about finding his Father's will. Prayer is often thought of wrongly. It is used infrequently, and it is ignored too often until circumstances become so overbearing that we have no other alternative. You see, we can figure ourselves out of a lot of the messes we get into. We can figure a lot of the stuff going on. But the truth is, is we ought to be using prayer consistently and regularly up front before we do anything else. We tend to believe that prayer is what we do to overcome God's reluctance, and it is not. Did you hear that? We tend to think that prayer is what we do to overcome God's reluctance. It's not. Prayer is laying hold of the will of God. When you pray, you pray asking for the will of God. Jesus is that prayer pattern. Jesus is that person who showed us that very thing. First, we create a successful prayer plan. Secondly, we follow a successful prayer pattern. Thirdly, we must develop a successful prayer practice. This is discipline. This is hard. This is not easy. This is, this is not something that's going to come to you naturally. You are going to have to fight your flesh. You're going to have to set aside time in your day. Just like a soldier who learns his weapon and has an intimate knowledge of what that weapon can do, so too the prayer warrior learns the weapon of prayer. He learns what the weapon of prayer, that the weapon of prayer can heal relationships that have been broken. Or she knows that the weapon of prayer can pull down strongholds that Satan has raised against a family, a church, or a nation. Folks, God wants us to learn what it is to use prayer effectively, efficiently, and victoriously. 
Isaiah. One of the most beautiful statements on prayer is found in Isaiah. God speaking through the prophet Isaiah said, My ear is not deaf that it cannot hear your prayers for help, nor is my arm short or weakened that it cannot reach out and help you, but your sins have built a wall between you and me. Your sins, your unwillingness uh, to, to follow after, your unwillingness to confess, your unwillingness to make things right. It's very much like this. Picture, if you will, a home builder as a kind of a representative of building your life. You're building your life, and you're a home builder, and you've got a wheelbarrow loaded down with brick, and you're wheeling it down the little path down to the home site. And as you hit a bump, a brick falls off, and you wheel the wheelbarrow on down a little further. Uh, you, you look at the brick as you go past it, but you don't pick it up. You think, I'll get it next go around. You go, you empty the brick out of the wheelbarrow, and you go back up to get another load of brick or material or whatever. As you come by, you bounce over that brick. It's in the way, and you bounce over it. You still look at it. Another brick falls off, and you just push on past it, and you leave the two bricks now. And if you do that enough times, the path gets blocked, and the house, your life, can't be built exactly the way it was intended to be built. That's the same way it is in our prayer life. God is saying that you need to get rid of the stuff that blocks His power, His flow, His will, His work in your life. Get rid of the stuff that's contrary to His will. Get rid of the sin. Just like a soldier that learns his weapon and learns it well, you and I need to learn what it is to use prayer properly so we can pray effectively for our churches, our families, our nations. The first prayer that any of us should be praying is, Lord, teach me to pray. We must practice prayer in order to be effective in prayer. It's a discipline that doesn't come naturally. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 and 4. Listen to what Paul said to the Corinthian church about this spiritual warfare that we're in. For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. God wants to use the power of prayer in your life to bring down satanic strongholds, not only in your own life, but in your family's life the church's life or even someone else's life, some lost person's life. God has placed everything under the feet of Jesus. All authority, all power, all dominion now answer to Jesus. And since we belong to Jesus and He dwells within us in the presence of the Holy Spirit, we can by His power overcome any enemy by His might and power. Setting aside time to build an intimate relationship with God by prayer will build strength in the discipline that brings victory when facing our enemy. The practice of prayer changes things. Mostly, however, it will change you. It changes you so that you can see your enemy, so that you can face your enemy, so that you can overcome your enemy. And it's right here. Facing your enemy, seeing your enemy, knowing that you have an enemy that's there. It's right there that the great deception and tragic place that so many believers wind up in. They face the enemy daily and they don't even know it. So many Christians face Satan and they don't even know that that's who they're face, that they're face to face with. They fight, they argue, they dispute, they belittle one another without knowing that the real enemy is hidden. It happens in churches, it happens in families, it happens with husbands and wives. The real enemy is not that person you love, it's not that fellow church member, it's not, it's not even the politician, it's Satan. And he's hidden, he's in a dark place, and we don't see him. That's why we need to be practicing the discipline of prayer and fighting in prayer. Others of us, now some of us get into the fights. We struggle, we fight, we wrestle with one another and we, and we don't see the enemy. But others of us remain under shame and guilt. We live under condemnation and we constantly put ourselves down. We feel depressed, we feel unworthy because we have failed to pray. Our practice should be praying always. 
like breathing in and breathing out. An unconscious act that is always at work. But we should also set aside those distinct times within our day to pray specifically. You need to carve out a part of your day that you give over to time in prayer, petitioning God. Jesus set that example for us as well. He was in a constant state of prayer so that no matter where he was or what was happening around him, he prayed. But he also got alone with God and spent time with his Father. And the power of God moved with him as he ministered to those who came to him. Jesus overcame satanic strongholds that Satan had erected in people's lives, and he did it through prayer. One example is found in Matthew 17. Uh, his disciples had tried to cast a demon out of a little boy, a little boy that was epileptic. It, 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 uh, the Greek word is uh, the same word for lunatic that we have here. It means struck by the moon. And there was a superstition in that day that when the moon was full, it would cause certain physical things to happen. And the little boy was an epileptic is what, what was happening, but it was because of this demonic influence, this demonic possession that had taken control of him. And so the dad brings the little boy to Jesus and said, your disciples have tried to cast this demon out, and it throws him into the fire, and it's destroying my son. Will you please help us? And Jesus looked at his disciples, and he said, oh, ye of little faith. And then he speaks to the demon, and he casts him out of the little boy, and the little boy is made whole. And then Jesus said in a private moment with his disciples, listen to these words. Jesus said this, this kind does not come out except by much prayer. And fasting. Let me give you a truth. If you pray little, you'll have little power. If you pray more, you'll have more power. But if you pray much, you'll have much power. And God wants to give you power to overcome satanic strongholds. First, we create a successful plan, a successful prayer plan. Secondly, we follow a successful prayer pattern. Third, we develop a successful prayer practice. But lastly, we pursue a successful prayer purpose. That's our motivation. What we pray for should, should align with the will of God and bring glory to God. Did you hear that? You see, that's, that's so, so much of the stuff it's being, Lord, oh, Lord, give me that new Cadillac. Oh, Jesus, I got to have that SUV. Got to have it. Need that bass boat. You hear what you're praying for? It's like a little child telling Santa all of the things he wants to get for Christmas. We see God as that Santa Claus, and he's not. Our prayer life should align with the will of God and be for the glory of God. And that, my brothers and sisters, is a successful prayer purpose. We are called to pray for our families, our churches, our nations, our nation and ourselves, and we will find victory when we pray in God's will and for God's glory, not our ease, our enjoyment, or our pleasure. Now listen to me. There are many young folks that will pray, they, they begin to date, and they're convinced this is a person I'm going to marry, this is a person I'm going to be with, and they begin to pray, God, make this happen, make this happen, and it would be the biggest mistake, the worst mistake of their life for God to make that happen. That's one part of it, bad relationships. When instead that young person should be praying, God, I pray for your will, I pray for your understanding, I pray for your wisdom, and if this relationship will not glorify you and does not bring glory to you, is not a, if it's contrary to your will, then Lord God, you show me. Now listen, young people, <laughs> you may not like the way God shows you. It may be through your mother or your father. When they say, I don't know why, but I see, sense deep in my spirit that this is not God's will for you. You ought to listen. Remember back at the first I said we need to pray for God-ordained authority? We hate authority. We have been taught to hate authority. And so when mom and dad take a stand and say, I have prayed about this, I cannot get peace about this, this is wrong, I believe this is wrong, and then we defy that authority and we move forward anyhow, I promise you it will be to your detriment, it will not be for God's glory. 
Listen to the God-ordained authority that's in your life. And listen to me carefully. Listen to me. Oh, my goodness, I want to chase this down. I want to stomp it and kill it. I wish I could just rip it out of your brains. Stop looking for signs. If this song is playing on the radio, it means I should be, marry this guy. <laughs> that song is playing on every radio station out there. There's a real good chance you're going to hear it. Stop looking for signs. The, Jesus even said that a wicked and evil generation seeks after a sign. It, look, if you spend time in God's Word, if you spend time in prayer, God will reveal His will to you, and I promise you, it will not be onerous. It will not be horrible. It will not be something you cannot accomplish through His power and His might. God wants to do great things in you and through you, but you have to be willing to hear His voice. We're looking for signs. Golly, I just wish I could just get rid of it. <laughs> I, I can't tell you how many young people, oh, I know it's the will of God because he was wearing a red shirt and I prayed. <laughs> young people, I love you. I just don't want you messing your lives up. God's got a great plan for you, but you got to want it. You got to want it. We're called to pray for our families, our churches, our nation, ourselves. We find victory when we pray in God's will and for God's glory, not our ease, enjoyment, or pleasure. Listen to what James 4, or James said in chapter 4, verse 3. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. Bazinga. <laughs> Does that tag you guys like it tags me? We do not demand from God. We humbly ask God. And then we ask that His will be done on earth as it's done in heaven. When Jesus stood in the Garden of Gethsemane and He prayed that the cup of suffering be taken away from Him, He followed up with these words, Not my will, but your will be done. Not my will, but your will be done. God's glory is found in the redemption of a sinner. God's glory is demonstrated in a life that's been changed by God's power. God's glory is revealed in us when we, by prayer, overcome the spiritual challenges of our lives. Prayer is a weapon when wielded successfully will overcome our wills. It will overcome the world's temptations. It will overcome Satan's wiles. Are you willing to become a successful prayer warrior? We can if we will. I'd like to conclude with three quotes, three examples from pr people who learned what it was to pray effectively. Well, one learned about the effective prayer of another. Mary, Queen of Scots, Bloody Mary, is reputed to have said, I fear the prayers of John Knox, a preacher in her day, more than all of the assembled armies of Europe. I fear one man's prayers more than the armies of all of Europe. Andrew Murray said this, God's child can conquer anything by prayer. Is it any wonder that Satan does his utmost to snatch that weapon from the Christian or to hinder him in the use of it? Satan wants to rip that, that away from you, and he will put all You get busy, you'll st your life will just fill up with stuff to do that will take you away from your time in prayer. And P.T. Forsyth said this, prayer is a weapon, a mighty weapon in a terrible conflict. Our prayers are to be continual, conscious, earnest effort of battle, the battle against whatever is not God's will. Do you believe that our nation can be changed? It'll be changed because God's people pray. Do you believe our church can see revival? We'll see revival because God's people pray. Do you believe God wants you to become a prayer warrior? It will happen 
when you decide to pray. The greatest prayer any of us will ever pray is God be merciful to me, a sinner. The second is like it. God, save that person that's nearest hell. God will change our society when we, through concerted prayer, begin to pray for the lost who are dying and going to hell. And I guarantee you, every one of us here knows somebody that does not know Jesus, that needs him as their Savior. You may be here today, and you've never given your heart to Christ. The first prayer you need to pray is, Jesus, be merciful to me. I'm a sinner, and I need you. You may be here today that you've been saved for a long time, but you've never practiced prayer. You need to say, Lord, from this point on, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to become a prayer warrior for you. Father, I pray that in the name of Jesus, you'll move hearts today. Lord, I pray for the lost. Lord, there may be someone here who came in, or was invited in, brought in, and they just don't know you. I pray for their salvation. I pray that you will enlighten their heart, that you will call them into your family. Lord, for my brothers and sisters, I pray that we will make a commitment to begin practicing prayer. That we'll begin to set up a pattern in our life, consistent, regular, disciplined. That God, we would be powerful men and women of God. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, do you know Jesus? Have you received him? This may be the very last opportunity God gives you to receive Christ. I invite you today, in the quietness of this moment, before we stand, before we all open this altar, I invite you in the quietness of this moment, ask Jesus to save you. The Bible teaches us if we will confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we shall be saved. He wants to save you. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. God wants to save you today. Will you receive him? Maybe you're like so many other Christians, struggling in your walk with Christ. It's because this most fundamental of disciplines as a Christian, prayer, is not a part of your life. And you want to commit your life to prayer this week, today. You want to say, Lord Jesus, I'm going to become a prayer warrior for you. Father, you move folks. You touch hearts. You change lives. According to your plan, according to your purpose, according to your will. And may it glorify you in Jesus' name.